Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I call this meeting of Committee of Workforce and Business Development, Finance and Policy to order. Members, please mute your mic. Uh, with that, I just wanted to inform you that this remote meeting is held pursuant to uh, Rule 10.01. Uh, I would like to call the committee legislative assistant to take the role. Nor. Present. Beijing. Present. Hamilton. Present. Faker. Faker. Gavney. Present. Frankie. Present. Greenman. Present. Haley. Present. Jurgens. Present. Cagle. Present. Cotiza Watoon. Cotiza Watoon. Olson. Present. Tu Zhong. Present. Baker. Baker. Cotiza Watoon. Cotiza Watoon. Chair, we have quorum. Thank you, uh, Jason, uh, Jason Chavez. Uh, there's a quorum present. I will now entertain a motion to approve the minutes for January 28th. Mr. Chair, so move. Representative Jay Zhong moves the, the approval for minutes uh, for January 28. Uh, any discussions? Any discussions? Mr. Chair, it's the 27th, just for correction for the minutes. Just wanted to correct uh, the date. It's January 27th, uh, minutes for January 27th. And that's the motion uh, moved by Representative Jay Zhong. Uh, any discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. See none. Uh, motion prevails. The minutes for January 27th have been approved. Uh, having said that, today we are going to take a little bit of a deep dive into conversation about the recommended budget for the Department of uh, Employment and Economic Development. Uh, we're lucky to have the Commissioner back here again. Uh, this is a moment for us to really look into where we are today, uh, where we've been, and where we're going, because we know uh, we have got a significant challenge in front of us. Uh, the economic uh, fallout impacted both employers and employees. So whatever we do in this committee should reflect uh, where we're headed, because that's what will take us to the next level. Uh, Commissioner uh, Grove, uh, welcome. Uh, please. Um, Introduce yourself to the committee again and proceed. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Steve Grove. I'm the uh, Commissioner of the Department of Employment and Economic Development. Uh, I'm joined today by colleagues at our agency. Uh, our Legislative Director, Daryl Dannon, is with us. Our Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Development, Hamza Warfa, is here. Our Deputy Commissioner for Economic Development, Kevin McKinnon, is here. And our uh, Assistant Commissioner for Operations, Evan Rowe, is with us as well. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you all today and to walk through it in more detail uh, the governor's COVID-19 recovery budget. I think Representative Knorr, uh, the chair, said it really well. This has been an unprecedented and challenging year for both workers and businesses, and we're happy to be talking about growth and, and what comes next. Um, responding to this pandemic has been something we've all been doing as it relates to our economy for the last 10 months. And our department uh, with your leadership and the governor's leadership has launched four separate small business support programs. Most recently, of course, the $215 million program that we all uh, passed last fall. And we put out about $9.7 billion and counting of unemployment insurance benefits to over 800,000 Minnesotans. But of course that work is not over. There's so much more that we need to do to get our economy on a strong footing for growth. And it's really, in times of, of great challenge that government needs to step in and help an economy survive and thrive and really put Minnesota on a strong footing moving forward. You know, one of the things that we hear consistently and I hear every single day talking to both businesses and workers 
is that the effects of this pandemic on our economy have not just been damaging, they've been really uneven. You know, you've got sectors like you know hospitality that have just been really, really harmed. I mean, sales tax revenues down, or sales revenue, sales re- revenues rather <clears throat> down forty percent over the year. Um, many of them have had to had to take a pause on being open for uh, to keep Minnesotans safe, and workers have faced huge challenges as well. Um, and at the same time, there's workers who've done really well and businesses who've done really well. So it's been an uneven effect this pandemic. Uh, and just to put it into perspective, if you are a black Minnesotan in the labor force today, there is a two out of three chance that you've been on unemployment insurance in the last year. 67% of black Minnesotans have had at least one week on our unemployment insurance system since this pandemic began. And it's that lower wage worker level of the economy as well. Um, if you make $15 or below in Minnesota's economy, you're more likely than any other group in, in the income strata to be on uh, unemployment insurance and to be unemployed as of the end of last year. So it's been an uneven effect, this recession. And um, and so businesses and workers are telling me, they're telling our department, I know they're telling all of you that government needs to focus on the workers most affected by COVID-19's impact and on the small businesses who need to thrive to really empower our growth and the jobs we need in months and years ahead. So the first part of the governor's COVID-19 recovery budget really looks at that kind of immediate recovery component. Again, we can't take our eye off the ball of what's needed really to help businesses get through this most challenging window of our experience with COVID-19. So the first uh, initiative I wanna walk you through today is the governor's proposal for a $50 million emergency COVID-19 recovery fund. And really uh, this is focused again on the hospitality businesses in our state Um, The program is very similar to the Small Business Emergency Loan Program that uh, we launched uh, almost a year ago at this point, uh, and that it has a a 50% forgivable loan structure around it. Loans would be at 0% interest rate, again, half of that forgiven. Um, And the amounts available we propose would be between $5,000 and $100,000. To ensure the money gets to those who need it most, uh, we would uh, encourage the development of a variety of targets within the bill. Half that money should go to Greater Minnesota. Uh, half that money should go to, money, to businesses in the seven county metro area. Um, we also think it's really important to ensure that a minimum amount of funds will be awarded to, uh, to businesses that are very, very small. So at least $15 million would go to micro enterprises, businesses with six or fewer full time employees. $10 million of that should go to majority owned minority business enterprises, so BIPOC owned businesses. Three million for operators of, of indoor uh, cultural malls and retail spaces, which are are critical not only to the economic viability of so many neighborhoods across the state, but also the cultural fiber of Minnesota. Uh, and then the balance of funds beyond those targets would go to hospitality businesses more broadly. So um, this would include a, a small admin fee to ensure that Deed could run the program. And we think that if this was put into gear and we we estimated our average of let's say a thirty six thousand dollar loan, it could help up to fourteen hundred businesses. And if loans are a little bit lower, let's say 29,000, up to 1,700 businesses could be, benefit from this program. So, um, you know, that the, the programs we've launched so far have been helpful. No, no business out there will tell you they've been enough. And again, this budget reflects the fact that we know more is needed to help businesses who have been hit the hardest by COVID-19. The second area in this recovery uh, portion of, of the COVID-19 budget is really focused on appropriation bonds for uh, businesses affected by the civil unrest that followed the death of George Floyd um, uh, last year. Um, the killing of George Floyd led to, to, as you all know, we've talked about several times, the exposure of long-standing structural systems of inequality and racism. And uh, the corridors of Minneapolis and St. Paul that need to be rebuilt are going to require government help. And we think appropriation bonds are really a great vehicle um, to accelerate that growth. Um, these bonds would go to the cities directly. They'd receive the funds. Um, they'd use it to acquire a property that otherwise isn't going to be redeveloped and put it to a public purpose. Um, so in our case, that'd be economic development, space for businesses, space for economic growth. Um, we, as, as a state government, would need to appropriate the annual debt service for these costs, which uh, is around $10, $10 million a year uh, for the life of the loan, uh, which would be, or sorry, of the bond. Um, And uh, this is a way for the cities to really accelerate economic growth in these corridors. The total amount we are uh, suggesting for this is $150 million in bonding uh, from DEED. There's an additional $100 million in this package for housing, which is being carried uh, with our our colleagues over at MHFA. So 
you know, this is a really critical part of rebuilding Minnesota's economy and, you know, really echoing the governor's themes of one Minnesota, it matters what our urban cores are like for businesses to everyone in the state because uh, economic activity uh, in one part of the state drives economic activity in other parts of the state. And so um, we think bonding is, is a good strategy to, to make some significant advancements here and to really make sure we maintain the character of the neighborhoods that were, that were affected by the unrest, right? Part of, part of having the city take on some of these properties um, and, and then again, lease them out for public purposes that we can ensure the kinds of businesses and, and, and people and entrepreneurs that, that made these areas flourish before can do so once again. So uh, a major component of this, this uh, package, again, it's a bonding package. The only general fund hit is that, that debt service on the bonds. And then there's a, there's a whole host of programs which I'm excited to go into really about small businesses and how we get our small business economy really up and running in the coming months ahead. And if this is really important for a lot of reasons. One, half of Minnesotans work at a small business. That, that's really where Minnesotans are employed. When you look at the research, it shows you that you know, all of the net new job creation in recessions is largely created by small businesses. Um, we know that when there's downturns, small businesses do increase. Uh, the number of people who start small businesses increase. Part of that, the research will tell you, is because people see a disruption and they, they find a new way to do something. Part of it's desperation. Uh, other jobs aren't available, and so they're starting something new. But for a whole host of reasons, you do see small business creation um, tick upwards. Minnesota has you know, a, a great record on businesses surviving once they're started. And in fact, I think we've discussed in this committee before, we're number one in the nation for business survivability. But for starting businesses, we're, we're really near the back of the pack. This is not a state that has traditionally had the, the most risk um, seeking behavior when it comes to starting something new. We know that will change in a downturn, but we wanna make sure it's as successful as possible when we get more people starting uh, companies. Um, and since this recession has began, we've seen a 20% drop in small business employment compared to the seven day rolling average from uh, a year before. So this is a really key part of our, our, our plan here. And one of the first things we're doing is focusing on a whole host of small business uh, assistance, technical uh, assistance providers throughout the state. These are organizations that really help that early stage small business get off, get off the ground. And starting something new is hard. It's lonely. It's difficult. And these organizations do a lot to make starting something uh, seem more doable and ultimately increase the hit rate and success rate of any small business that starts in Minnesota. So uh, we are proposing... Uh, $6 million, a $3 million uh, over each year of the biennium to really focus on these small business assistance providers having everything they need to succeed. Uh, $750,000 of that proposal each year would go to TA support, so technical assistance support. This allows these organizations to expand their outreach and technical assistance to businesses and entrepreneurs impacted by COVID-19. Average grant size would be around 65 k we think. Um, and so you could get a lot more organizations across Minnesota ramping up their technical assistance to small businesses. Another million and a half each year would go to a capital match program. And this is something that uh, the lenders across the state tell us is so important because oftentimes they need to uh, access federal funding to pull down for the small businesses that they serve. But in order to do that, these institutions have to have a certain equity component of their, uh, of their budget um, in place. And so what this would do is it would help those, those lenders secure enough equity to be qualifying for federal matches and we get more federal money drawn down. Ultimately, this money would be repaid back to the state. So in a sense, it's kind of a long-term loan of, of a period of around 10 years or so, but it can really help us make sure we take advantage of the federal funding that these uh, CDFIs and other certified lenders need to get more small businesses moving. And that's, that's what it's all about at the, at the end of the day is how much money can you pull into the system and get out to these small businesses quickly so they can ramp up with the capital that they need to be successful. So um, that's a key component of this package. And then lastly, we're focused on the incubators too. And, and these are um, you know, smaller organizations that help new or exp expanding uh, small businesses um, really ramp up, oftentimes focused on, on minority, veteran, or women business owners. Uh, many of you may have been to the Midtown Global Market or, or other cultural malls and seen organizations operating in, in this way where you know, a, a smaller business will come, they'll incubate for a little bit, they'll get some, some practice at, uh, at, at beginning their commercial lines and then, and then move on to a full-fledged business. These incubators are critical for growth. This $750,000 a year would be used for capital and equipment costs related to launching new or expanding existing incubators. This is something we hear a lot about from 
from some of the organizations that focus on really early stage businesses. So, so this first piece here is just really, again, focusing on these technical assistance providers and making sure they have what they need to help every new business have the best shot possible uh, at succeeding. The next area of focus on small businesses focuses on our small business development centers. And uh, you all know these well, they're in your districts, I'm sure, uh, and they are critical uh, providers of consulting early stages of businesses to help them succeed. They help businesses develop business plans and they help them um, meet other uh, matching requirements. And um, these uh, centers, which are largely in greater Minnesota, I think eight of the nine regional centers are based in greater Minnesota, um, provide a whole host of services, but they also deliver services based on kind of a matching component. So um, the state puts up a little bit of money, the regional center puts up about 45% of the money, and then they get a federal match for about 45% of the money. Um, our suggestion in this budget is to put $500,000 a year into that regional match so that the folks who are in these regional small business development centers can spend their time actually consulting the businesses on how to grow rather than fundraising money to develop uh, the matching money they need for the federal for the federal funding. So this is one of those things where we can significantly lighten the load on our regional partners across the state uh, and give them what they need to spend all of their time making sure every small business that is launched uh, in their area has a chance to succeed. So um, we think when we do the math on this one, that by lightening that load and giving more time to focus on the businesses, it'll be roughly 30,000 hours that they'll get in exchange for, for this money. That could help create about 4,600 jobs, 200 new businesses, $100 million in small business capital infusions, um, and $25 million in increased sales revenue. So, um, you know, this is this is a really big one. And I think um, it's one of those things where it's, it's not a huge item in the balance sheet compared to everything else, but the way that it works with uh, our SBDCs is really going to help them be successful. And you know, I'll pause just a moment to kind of put a face on this, because I think um, you all know people in your districts who've, who've benefited from SBDCs. This is just but one story. Um, this is a story of, uh, of Matteo Maccabee and Aaron Lucas, who opened uh, a restaurant called Crew in St. Joseph. And they used uh, small business development center resources to get the business plan right, uh, to plan ahead for the growth of their restaurant. They did this you know, during the pandemic, so not exactly an easy time to launch a restaurant. But with the help of that SBDC, they're able to cut the ribbon on their new facility um, and, and get off and running. And this is, this is just one of thousands of stories across the state where you know, a little help from, from some consultants can really speed up the pathway to starting a business and, and creating more jobs. So SBDCs are, are a big part of the plan. And then I think, you know, another area that we've talked about here before and we'll talk about a lot in the coming months is how Minnesota really distinguishes itself as a place to create a high growth uh, technology-based startup. And one of the tools we've long had uh, at, the, at the ready for our state is the angel tax credit. It's been around uh, almost 10 years. We were one of the first states to create this program. Uh, it's been funded at various levels throughout its existence. In essence, it's pretty simple. It's a 25% credit to investors or investment funds that make equity investments in startups. And these are startups who are focused on high technology or, or new proprietary technology. Um, the maximum credit is capped at 125K per person, 250 if you're filing jointly. Uh, and again, it's been funded at a variety of levels since its inception. The great thing about this is that it also brings in matching investments um, from the private from private sources too. And so um, we've issued about $111 million in tax credits to these investors since the program began, but it's generated $461 million in private investment. So a huge force multiplier. And the data shows us too that over 50% of the money that comes into this tax credit program to help Minnesota startups grow comes from outside the state. And that's a big deal because what it, it, it says is we're attracting people's attention to Minnesota as a startup ecosystem, as a place where great young new companies and technology can thrive. And having this, this tax credit kind of puts a flag out there and says, hey, you know, welcome. We want, we want you to come here uh, and be a part of our startup ecosystem and, uh, and, and invest in the companies that are going to create the next big Fortune 500s in Minnesota. So um, this is an important component of, of the program. Um, there is a, a critical carve out that was passed last year or two years ago, rather, that um, we're really excited about, which indicates that 50% of the money in this tax credit has to be reserved for startups who are created outside of the Twin Cities metro area and or by women, veteran or BIPOC owned uh, startups. And so 
really there's a huge focus on equity in this program. We think that's really important and we really have ramped up our outreach efforts on that front because every year we, we run this, we wanna make sure that more uh, underestimated entrepreneurs, if you will, able to take advantage of this credit through, through more venture capital flowing into Minnesota. So the angel tax credit is, is a big component. And then the other part of the governor's budget that really focuses on startups is Launch Minnesota. And uh, Chair Noel remember this well as he authored the bill uh, last time to create this program but just a, a really critical program to really shine a spotlight on our startup ecosystem and make it easier to start a, a company in our state. Launch Minnesota um, has uh, a couple of components to it. It has uh, some innovation grants that help early stage startups get going that the money can either go to you know, matching a, a federal grant request or it can go to, to uh, R&D costs, kind of some of those early stage costs startups have to get going, any sort of business liquidity needs, it, it, it helps fund those. Again, we're, we're really honing in on the really early stage companies, the kind of thing where somebody may have an idea, but they don't quite know if they want to take the risk and start it. Launch Minnesota makes that more viable. It gives them the kind of incentive to, to dive in and try something new. Um, so that's really the bulk of it is those innovation grants that go directly to the entrepreneur. Uh, but there's another really key component to this too, which is our entrepreneurship education grants. And this is really about making sure that our efforts to grow Minnesota's startup ecosystem are statewide. And then we're connecting the dots between you know, Duluth or Alexandria or Bemidji or Mankato or Rochester or Winona or, or the Twin Cities and beyond. And this edu education grant program has helped us build really a hub and spoke model that is really unique to Minnesota. It it's contains six regions, uh, eight different hubs with 85 program partners. These are the kinds of organizations that can teach a early stage startup how to create a business plan, what, what uh, venture capital models look like for early stage startups, the kind of education that's needed to, again, speed up that process from idea to, um, you know, to success with, with, the, with having a, a sort of e an ecosystem and an educational effort to support it. Um, we think this is a really critical part of making sure a state has a good startup ecosystem. Um, it puts Minnesota on the map in, in a way by saying that um, we're, we're a place where these kinds of uh, businesses can thrive. And it, it just creates a, a whole host of connections between people across the state. Um, one of the great things it does is connects the Twin Cities to other startup markets around Minnesota. And there, there's just a lot of benefit from that kind of adjacency that, um, that this network can create. Um, the state's really kind of the only one with the with a statewide footprint in that sense to be able to run such a program. And that's why um, we think government has to play a key role here. The amount is only $5 million, but it, it goes a long, long way towards really differentiating Minnesota's uh, ecosystem. And just to give you a sense for, for kind of the flavor of this program and, and what it means on the ground, you know, um, we've had a lot of successful grantees uh, in, in Launch Minnesota. Um, Michelle Marins, the founder of WeSparkle, um, is one of the, the individuals who's gotten an innovation grant and that's helped her company really take off. And, you know, she's just a great example of an entrepreneur who, uh, based on a little bit of funding, was able to do a lot more than she otherwise would have been able to. And, and she really sings the, the program's praises. She says, I appreciate the amazing work done around Minnesota Angel Tax Credit and Launch Minnesota. You're helping us build a stronger, more inclusive economy here in Minnesota. The funding allowed me to hire my first full-time employee and the software that we've built together has now helped several small businesses in Minnesota connect with over 400 new customers and earn more revenue despite this pandemic. These programs have a huge uh, ripple effect. Um, we Sparkle, by the way, is a, a software that helps businesses schedule appointments and uh, answer customer questions. A great B2B uh, platform that Michelle has built and we're, we're honored to be a part of supporting it to grow. So, um, you know, I think we all have read the headlines of people leaving Silicon Valley for other parts of the country and, and virtual work making technology ecosystems elsewhere a lot more attractive given other quality of life factors and, and things like that. We want to make sure Minnesota is on the cutting edge of that trend line. We don't want to see folks moving from San Francisco to Miami or to Austin. We want them to come here. And this, these programs are really a part about accelerating that trend and welcoming Minnesota for more money uh, and more startup founders and, and more growth. So um, those are two really key components of the governor's budget uh, in this space. So I'll just say before we move on to some, some of the programs we've built or that we are advocating for, for for workers, that there is another component to our budget that is focused on broadband, um, not in this committee's jurisdiction, so we won't go too, into it too deeply, but it's all connected in terms of making sure that you can start a business, uh, access information anywhere in the state. And so the governor does have $50 million in his budget for broadband grants too, um, which we're really excited about. So turning to workers, I think 
you know, one of the things, again, with this uneven effect that COVID-19 has had on our economy is that uh, some workers have really suffered and others have not. And the specifically unique challenge of this recession is that there have been the recession really has only been for certain parts of the economy, right? And you've got a lot of workers who've been dislocated from jobs, say in hospitality, um, who might need some kind of training or reskilling or, or, or a pathway to another industry, even if just for the short term, to make sure that they are uh, able to survive and thrive. So it's this kind of odd paradox where even though there's there's a lot of jobless came, claims right now, there are there is opportunity out there. We just need to have the best possible reskilling strategy to ensure that uh, new industries uh, can can take off um, with enough workers to really to really grow their their work. And so um, there's a lot happening in our workforce today, and in terms of our economy and where the jobs are. And we need to be on the cutting edge of all of that. One of the things that is at the central aspect of our, our strategy on workforce is taking a look at that workforce development fund. And I think this is a topic that is robust enough and um, detailed enough that it probably merits its own hearing uh, at some point in this session, which we'd be uh, thrilled to, to do. Um, but the big picture is this. The Workforce Development Fund is a fund that is funded by the businesses of Minnesota. They pay a payroll tax into a system through which then primarily D, but also partially the Department of Labor, use that funding to train workers that then cycle back into these businesses. So it's a really unique thing Minnesota has. Not every uh, state has such a fund. In fact, I don't think any other state has a fund quite like this. It's one of the kind of secret sauces to our state's workforce. However, you know, this was created back in the 1980s and really hasn't been modernized ever since. And it's had kind of a journey, and I think in the last four or five years in particular, there's just been a lot of um, conversation about how to modernize this fund to make sure that it's really rooted in the workforce challenges of today. And central to that challenge is the issue of equity. Um, we have a very different workforce than we did in 1985 when this program was created. And the program as it currently sits uh, does not do a particularly good job of fairly and transparently and clearly emphasizing uh, the, the equity struggles that our economy faces or even as efficiently allocating capital to growing the workforce that we have today as it maybe, maybe could. So we've been on a months long journey really since, uh, really since the last biennial budget session to talk to many of you, to businesses, to workforce organizations to figure out how could this fund be better organized and better targeted to be successful for Minnesota. And um, we are bringing forward a plan on what that will look like that we're really eager to dig into you in, in more detail. Uh, it does emphasize equity and making sure that we spend more money than ever before and helping uh, BIPOC workers uh, get access to the training they need, need to succeed. It has a big emphasis on uh, favoring competitive grants over direct appropriations. One of the things that happens over time is as legislators have kind of scratched their head a little bit at the structure of this fund. They've kind of gone to the, the default mode of suggesting direct appropriations to better spend it, which is totally understandable. Um, but we think we can have a competitive grant system where there's a really clear sense of what kind of outcomes we're looking for and the right kind of benchmarks and targets to make sure we're spending the money wisely that can make this a lot more transparent and effective and fair. And then I think that common sense, again, of, of performance standards um, is critical and having a really clear sense that really at the end of the day, Workforce is about placements, wage rates, and retention. You know, did you get a job? How much money did you make? And, uh, and did you keep that job for a long period of time? Now, there are other aspects to workforce too that we think should be considered in this fund. Support services are a big one. We know that for some people, just getting uh, a little bit of help around the edges to be in a position to even apply for a job is really important, whether that's childcare or, or basic um, you know, economic needs. So we have a, a competitive grant program set aside for workforce uh, services as well. And then lastly, there's, there's really, I think, a, a need to focus on innovation here. There's all kinds of new approaches being created by community leaders, by those on the ground who really understand what's going on out there and what workers need. And we need to have a competitive program for innovation too, so that um, new organizations don't have to have some lengthy proven record of success to try something new. We can pilot it, see if it works. And if it does, using the standards that we've all agreed on, um, move them up into a, sort of a competitive grant pool. But that idea of you can both innovate and measure performance at the same time, that doesn't need to be mutually exclusive. This fund needs to really you know, embrace that. And then I think just being efficient about dislocated worker funds to make sure we are taking care of those who, who get laid off, but we recognize um, that the trajectory of the, the use of that program and make sure we appropriately allocate money, but don't over allocate it. So um, there's a whole host of issues here to get, get at, but I would say performance, equity, and innovation are the three things that really 
are, we're focused on and, and reimagining this fund. And again, I think um, we should come back together uh, in the future and discuss it in a little bit more detail. But very excited for that one. We think it's it's a budget neutral item. It's not we're not raising or lowering taxes or anything like that. But we think realigning it will really help. Um, the next area that we want to focus on is making sure that we have um, training for the jobs of the future in our state. And you know, one of the things we've piloted in the last couple of years is really honing in on the impact of automation in the workforce, and particularly automation in the manufacturing sector. Um, larger manufacturers can pretty quickly and easily automate when they need to, and they've done that traditionally over time. And certainly that's a trend that has hugely accelerated throughout this pandemic. More and more employers automate when, um, when labor shortages are a challenge and when labor disruptions happen. But the smaller manufacturers have a harder time doing this. You know, whether it's the cost of the machine itself or whether it's the training hurdle to get going, um, we've been piloting ways to mitigate against that to help um, Minnesota's smaller manufacturers really uh, accelerate the trend towards automation to improve productivity and improve the jobs of the people that they hire. Again, these firms are hiring people hand over fist. They can't get enough workers. Um, automation will help them um, create better jobs, more attractive jobs, and ultimately better output and productivity. So this program, the Job Training Incentive Program, puts money aside, um, about $250,000 per year, to allow uh, employer, small manufacturers, 100 businesses or less, to um, develop training programs for automation that get their workers more quickly uh, trained up and ready to use uh, new technologies in the workplace. Um, this en enhances not only the, the company's ability to create profits, but it enhances the skill sets of the workers this program is designed to help. Um, and so we've, I guess we've piloted this. We want to make sure that our, our premonition was right and that this was actually a need. And we were flooded with applications. All kinds of manufacturers really wanted this funding to help enhance their, their workers' skill sets, to help automation happen more effectively. So having done that pilot, we feel really confident that this is a program that we need to double down on to make sure we are creating the jobs of the future in Minnesota. So, um, so that's uh, this program is called the Automation uh, Training Incentive Program. And we are suggesting $250,000 per year in grants that we can use uh, to help, uh, to help work, uh, businesses and workers take advantage of the program. The next area you want to focus on is childcare. And, you know, I'm sure every one of you, every single day, hears from someone in your district who talks about the challenges that exist with childcare in our state. And look, this was an issue even before the pandemic. This is almost all I heard about when we first started here from, from uh, businesses across the state and workers too, who just didn't have the childcare they needed, uh, you know, to make sure their workforce could show up. And we were 80,000 slots short in the state overall, again, before the pandemic even started. And man, if we needed a reminder of how important childcare is, we certainly have gotten it over the past year. Um, so it's a, big, it's a big barrier to working. It's a particularly big barrier for women in, in working and for single parents and for low-income parents and for rural parents. So again, recognizing the uneven effect this pandemic has had on our economy, our childcare work should do the same. Um, why is this a deed, right? You'd think this might be like a DHS initiative or something like that. Well, um, we have a proven program at DEED that was started uh, several years ago, focused on helping child care providers get the business aspect of their, their operations right, to be able to, to ramp up those businesses really quickly. Um, this is a really proven program. It's critical. Um, it's not in the base, which is why we're asking for uh, this additional funding. It's $750,000 a year. Um, it, we entertain floods of proposals every year when we put these grants out. Um, most recently, we got 39 proposals totaling $6.3 million, um, and there was far more, uh, far more uh, demand than supply for that program. We only had $1.7 million to, to put out. So again, these awards, they range from $1,500 to $150,000. $75,000 is about the average for the program. And they're really just their funds that are uh, you know, funding projects that are projected to provide child care services to an additional uh, 4,400 children when facilities uh, reach their license capacity. So um, this is really about uh, funding those organizations that can get child care slots up and running quickly and help entrepreneurs who start these businesses to do it well. Because most of the time, if you're a child care provider or someone who seeks to be one, your expertise is in kids. It's not in business, it's in kids. And that's where it should be. We, we need people who understand uh, youth development and, and child care to be the ones starting these businesses. Deed needs to step in and help them on the business side of things, which is why uh, this proposal exists. Um, incredibly important for our state's workforce. And just to give you, again, a sense of this, you all have stories of these from, from your districts, I'm sure, 
Um, one I like to share comes from uh, Spicer, Minnesota, where, um, where we had a big shortage in child care. And um, this YMCA Early Learning Center that was open in late December 2019 got a 50K grant from DEED for equipment and supplies, along with about $775,000 in community funding. Uh, before COVID, they could serve about 80 to 90 children. Um, but Jenny Holweger, who, who runs this Candy Ohio County uh, area YMCA, said, Without the deed grant, we couldn't have provided all the opportunities that exist in this center. Each room is equipped with developmentally appropriate materials, toys, books, and equipment to help children learn and grow. Those items are extremely important to their social, emotional, cognitive, and physical growth, she said. Uh, quality child care made available because of the deed grant is a cornerstone of a strong community. Everyone benefits. So this is just, again, one of the many stories we hear across the state of child care providers who benefit from these grants. And uh, it's a program, again, that's been proven and that we are uh, in, in favor of uh, expanding with this additional $750,000 from the general fund. So uh, child care is something you've all heard a lot about. You know, I know another thing you've all heard a lot about, um, and we certainly have to indeed over the last year is unemployment insurance. And as we spoke about a couple of years, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, this program has gone under extraordinary uh, stress. It has delivered for Minnesotans. Um, but it has also helped us kind of expose some of the challenges in unemployment insurance and some of the things that aren't really working all that well. And there's a much broader, probably national conversation to have on just the whole role of UI in 2020 versus back in 1935 or so when it was started. Um, but one of the, there's two things in Minnesota that we think our state statutes need to do to really modernize this program and make it more fair. Uh, one of them is to focus on expanding unemployment insurance to young people. And you know, this is something that is uh, really kind of one area of our unemployment insurance statutes that really puts Minnesota kind of behind other states. We are one of the few states where we have such a clear prohibition against um, paying secondary students unemployment insurance from our, our normal unemployment insurance program. Um, the crazy thing about it is employers actually pay into the system for those, those workers. So it's not as if uh, you know, employers somehow get a break on a young person working for them and therefore they don't pay the taxes. They pay the taxes on, on every worker if they're a tax paying employee for unemployment insurance. So really, uh, this is about delivering the funds to, or the, the supports to workers who are already uh, in the system and being paid for. And I think, you know, way back in whatever it was, the late 30s when this law was uh, first created, uh, I can only assume that, you know, part of it was, well, they're just kids and maybe this is just spending money and so the state shouldn't cover the cost. Well, we know this is very different today. And the youth advocates who've been on the forefront of really pushing for this law have, have taught me and taught so many across the state that, no, in fact, many of them are supporting their families, that the, the wages they bring in uh, in any given day aren't for, you know, a, a new, you know, video game. They're to put food on the table. And, uh, the fact that they can't receive unemployment insurance benefits if they qualify in the same way that everybody else in the state does is really just something that is deeply unfair. So um, we are uh, going to fight for expanding unemployment insurance to secondary students. This would cost the trust fund about $20 million a year. Again, that trust fund paid into by the very uh, same taxpaying employees who pay into it for high school students already. Um, this is just a, a matter of justice and we need to do it. So um, we are eagerly uh, awaiting further discussions on that on that component. And then there's one other area of unemployment insurance that we are suggesting a change to. And this is widening the kind of acceptable training that you can be engaging in while you're searching for a job. You know, one of the ways that unemployment insurance works is it's meant to cover, you know, part of your wages when you're dislocated from a job for no reason uh, that is of, of your own fault. And there's an aspect of the system that has something called reemployment assistance training, because ideally, when you get back into the job market, you get a job that's even better than the one you left. That helps you earn more money, that helps the economy grow, uh, and it serves the needs of our employers all the better. And so when you're in an unemployment insurance situation, you can take training. And that training, if it's in a certain category of classes, can really help uh, you get a better job when you get back into the market, but it also prevents you from taking just the next available job because it happens to be there, right? Um, and so uh, the, the list of sort of training courses that are allowed to be taken during that period of time is not particularly modern. And there are a couple of classes that we think very much should qualify uh, as skills advancement trainings that would allow you to put a pause on taking the very next job so you can get a better one. Um, that include, for example, English as a second language training, which is critical, or even just the GED. Um, neither of those currently qualify as trainings you could take while off of unemployment insurance. So this is just basic skill stuff, but man, 
if you have that training that, that can help a worker advance into a jo job that's much better, much more needed by a business, everybody wins, the business, the worker, and the state. So um, it's policy change. It's not really budget change, but there's, of course, an aspect to it that touches the trust funds. So we wanted to mention it here. And I think, again, this is about uh, creating a system where we can really help workers um, succeed as much as possible uh, as they inflect to new jobs and, and reskill into new areas. So those are the two changes we wanted to bring forward on unemployment insurance. Um, you know, I think the other social safety net program that we've discussed, uh, you know, in our state a lot of the last couple of years, and certainly has been discussed at the federal level, level too, is paid family medical leave. And paid family medical leave is a policy that, you know, even our former president and Congress uh, were in favor of, and you saw that when they passed the Family's First Coronavirus uh, Recovery Act, the FFCRA, that gave families some paid leave when the pandemic first hit. This is a, a program that almost every modern nation and, and several nations that you wouldn't consider particularly um, you know, developed have on their statutes. And in Minnesota, uh, this is an area where we can really provide uh, some leadership. Several other states have done this. Uh, we've been studying those programs and learning from them. And it's just an incredibly important. It has been uh, clear, made so clear over the past uh, 10 to 11 months, why this is needed, right? Um, in any given year, 10% of Minnesota workers take a family or medical leave, right? So one in 10 do. And 26% of those leaves aren't covered by any wage replacement. So people are just out on their own. They don't have a single dime from anybody to cover themselves without taking care of, care of their newborn baby or their, uh, their, their loved one who is sick. Um, so this kind of wage replacement is really, is really critical. And again, it helps uh, small businesses and workers that face the most struggles uh, the most, right? Because if you make more money, you're likely to be a part of a company that might have such a program already. Um, and if you're a small business, it's much harder to start something like this at scale. Uh, and so this program uh, is focused on helping all the state with a program that, that works. Um, and the way that the budget on this plays out is as follows. In order to build such a system, you have to actually create uh, the platform, uh, the platform that you pay into uh, the, 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 the premium would be paid into. So there's $11.4 million of general fund money that would go to starting up the building of that platform. Um, over time, that money will be paid back by the premium. So ultimately, this would be a, a, a budget neutral proposal. Um, but when the platform is built, then it would pull in a 0.6% employer premium, uh, of which it would be allowed to have half picked up by the employer and half picked up by the employee. Um, the total cost of building this platform will be around $67 uh, million. But again, once we've got that startup cost just to get going, the payroll taxes that we begin to collect will, uh, help, will help finish off the technology build. Um, and ultimately, this program will replace wages on, on kind of a tiered uh, schedule. So uh, anywhere between 55 to 90% of an employee's salary, we, we estimate an average around 66% of the wage replacement would be there. Um, and if you do the math on this, again, assuming that the costs are covered half by employer, and half by employee, this is the cost of, cup, co cost of a cup of coffee per week per worker that would be required to build this program out. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a critical factor for our workforce. It's incredibly important for child development to have parents at home those early days in particular. And as we've seen with the pandemic, life happens to people and having the ability to take care of things while uh, some of their wages are replaced is something that can make our, our workforce and our economy an even more attractive one to be in. So pay family medical leave, and again, I think that's something we'll get into more detail probably in its own standalone hearing, I, I would guess, but those are the broad strokes of how PFML uh, would work. And then there's a, there's a series of other initiatives I want to make sure we, we walk through too that are, um, that are sort of in different pockets of the department, but are, I think, important to, to walk through. One of them is really focused on our labor market information office. And uh, if you haven't uh, heard the name Labor Market Information Office before, that's fine, but you probably heard a lot of the data they, they turn out. This is an amazing group at, at Deed who is full of uh, economists who really uh, inform businesses and, uh, and workers and policymakers across the state on just what's happening in our economy. And you can imagine this is a unit that in the last year has really been kicked into overdrive as we try to figure out what exactly is happening in our state's economy and how can we help businesses and workers adjust to it. And so um, with a smaller budget ask here of 125,000 that would support really a, a real-time pandemic recovery data project, which um, includes the addition of UI insurance statistics, real-time job postings out of the National Labor Exchange, a whole host of new research um, that we think will make our state a, a lot stronger and have a lot clearer vision into what's happening in our economy. 
Um, and this money would go to the staffing and the data storage required to do that analysis. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about uh, one of the, the some of the areas of, of budget reduction, because of course, as we've gone through the process of uh, of looking at our budget, we want to be sound fiscal managers of the state's uh, funds, and we want to make room for the for the funding for funding the programs that we think are really going to help the most people uh, by reducing others uh, along the way, and so. Uh, on the budget reduction front, um, we've taken a look at a couple different programs for which we're suggesting reductions. One is, is the Minnesota Investment Fund and Job Creation Fund. These are uh, our state's economic development incentive programs. They are critical uh, to growing business in the state. And when we look at the historical trajectory of the awards we would give in any given year, and particularly a year where there are more economic challenges, um, we think a reduction of around $10 million over the biennium uh, is appropriate, and that we can still cover the projected run rate of those funds and uses for, for growth of, of, our, of our businesses and business expansion projects um, without losing out. So that reduction of 10 million is 10 million they can go to many other programs that in a challenging time uh, will need the money. And we feel um, comfortable with the, with the change there given, uh, given again the, the run rate for the program. Um, and it, it just reflects kind of the, the demand, the reduced demand we expect in the current economic climate. The other area that we're recommending cutting is a higher ed career advising program. This was a pilot program launched some time ago. It was $250,000 a year. Um, it was a pilot um, to kind of help high school students uh, examine job opportunities. It never really expanded beyond the pilot program. Um, it, it's not really received significant funding to become a full-fledged program. And again, given it was just a pilot, we think um, a program by a small amount can give uh, better priority to other initiatives. And then the last area of reduction is on our trade office. Um, obviously, trade is critical to Minnesota's growth, um, but we're not flying around the world anymore, at least not this year, to help advance the work of our trade office. And so given the reduced costs without um, that travel being in there, we have a reduction of, uh, of about $300,000 from, from the trade office here. That also includes the sunsetting of, of the Trade Policy Advisory Council, something that was uh, was tried over the last few years, but sunsetted on January 1 of this year. So some cost savings there that we think uh, will help. And then on the same slide here, we have just a, a budget shift. This is not a, a budget cut or uh, it's, a, it's a budget neutral move, but essentially um, this involves a, a program called extended employment. And this is an employment program that provides ongoing employment support services to individuals with disabilities uh, so that they can keep their jobs and advance in their careers. It's a really critical program. We need to keep funding it at the same amount, um, but over time, it has lived either under general fund dollars or workforce development fund dollars. It makes sense kind of in, in either based on its intent. It's kind of moved back and forth. We'd suggest given the current funding climate moving into the workforce development fund, which would free up some more money in the general fund. Um, and so that's about a $5 million shift, uh, again, from the general fund to the workforce development fund. Um, so that's an important change as well. Um, and then uh, a couple of final things, you know, we, we have a unique situation in a deed with the state services of the blind, which you heard about from Deputy Commissioner Blake Chafee in our original overview of what deed does. Um, the state services of the blind is an incredible organization that lives within deed that helps uh, those who are blind um, both have the support services they need, but also find jobs. And one of the kind of really neat historical legacies of the program is that it's, it gets a decent amount of funding from donations. So um, foundations or wealthy donors will give money to it. Oftentimes families of people who've had someone who's, who's had, who's become blind or suffer from blindness. And so um, this ability to take in donations is really critical, but to make the ability to be able to take in donations, um, we need to have a foundation account that can take in that money so that those who submit, the, to, who donate the money can get the tax benefits that come with that donation. So this is a really minor technical issue in a sense, um, but it is something that will makes a big difference to that program because of the ways in which it allows funding to, to take place. And there's just been some statutory question marks around uh, the ability of foundations to, to take in money for the state and then spend it uh, at our discretion. And so we are suggesting uh, that we just clarify that and ensure that, that we can in fact take in money from donations and deposit them into foundations so that we can continue to expand the services for, for blind workers across Minnesota. Um, and then lastly, before I wrap, and excited to take your questions and hear what's on all of your minds, um, is an operating budget adjustment. Um, this helps cover the increasing costs of 
work at our agency. Um, we, uh, the last time we had operating budget uh, increase was in uh, fiscal years 18 and 19. Um, we are suggesting um, uh, some reductions here and increases to ensure we have the right operating budget for, uh, for the agency. Um, and this is just ensuring that we uh, can provide the best services possible to Minnesotans. Um, this, the impact that we have on services uh, are, are critical. And I think if the adjustment isn't provided, it would result in some of the following issues. It would re re uh, result in reduced agency efficiency, decreased inability to strategically manage risk, lower government transparency and accountability, uh, a decline in continuity for grantees, increased burden on other program budgets, significant increase in audit risks, uh, and a decreased capacity of staff to provide a lot of client services. So this is critical. Obviously, everyone in state government, yourselves all included as, as legislators, are working overtime like never before. Um, but just in, in a basic sense of ensuring our, our agency can do the work that it is tasked to do, we have an operating adjustment in our budget ask as well. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll stop there. Maybe just add a couple of closing thoughts. You know, again, like I mentioned at the top, this budget is focused on helping those who've suffered the most at the hands of COVID-19. That's why it's called the COVID-19 recovery budget. Uh, and you'll see a focus on equity throughout the entire budget. Uh, we know that black and brown Minnesotans have been disproportionately affected by this pandemic. We know that's where all of our labor force grow growth is coming in the next 10 years. And closing racial wealth gaps is not just a, a moral issue. It is an economic one. If we actually close racial wealth gaps in this country, if they didn't exist, our GDP would be estimated to be over $1.5 trillion higher than it is now. That's a, a report that McKinsey put out recently. So uh, this is a big deal. When we close gaps, we have not only a more fair economy, but more efficient and more prosperous for all Minnesotans. So, you know, we are bullish on Minnesota's economy. This isn't a time of extraordinary challenge, but it's also a time of huge opportunity. And it's in these downturns where great innovation happens and where the next big companies can get created. You look back to you know, the, the, the Great Recession when you saw many of the major uh, technology platforms we use today, for example, uh, be created, whether that's WhatsApp or Venmo or Uber or Slack. Um, people see disruptions in times of challenge and they take advantage of them. And we wanna make sure Minnesota is on the forefront of that change. We've got a diverse economy, which generally means that we can weather recessions better than the average state, but nothing is inevitable in these times. And COVID's effect has been really unique. And um, it's a time we think to really invest in our state and our workforce uh, and in small businesses, because that's where we think the biggest growth can come. And that's who's been hardest hit by the events of the last year. So this budget really stands in that space. And um, we're very eager to work with you on, on all of it and to continue to discuss all of your ideas too. It's going to be a really important conversation we're having in this committee over the coming uh, weeks and months ahead. And we're, we're excited for that conversation. So I think Mr. Chair, with that, I'll turn it back over to you and eager to take questions from the committee. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Commissioner, for your presentation. Uh, members, as you're aware of, this is the based on November 2020 focus, and this will change based on the February focus that is coming up. Um, I just wanted to note uh, we do have uh, Representative Kutiza Watun and Becca in attendance. And with that, I wanted to ask uh, Representative uh, Jorgens to proceed and ask his question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Grove. I have a, a question on the $150 million in the governor's proposal for appropriation bonds. Who would be uh, eligible to receive these funds? Is this just for public infrastructure like the third precinct or would businesses also be eligible to apply for the, these funds? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Representative, it's a great question. Appropriation bonds are a little bit different than your typical general obligation bond in the sense that you have to appropriate the debt service on it every year to pay for, for the bond. But essentially, the cities themselves would take these this this funding on, and they would use it to buy up parcels of land that are not going to be redeveloped. Essentially, the owner of the land doesn't have the funding or the motivation or, or, or the ability to rebuild, and so the city takes on the rebuilding of that um, property themselves. But it comes with specific guidelines in terms of what they can use that property for. So it would rebuild something that maybe used to be a storefront, but it would need to be a storefront again and have a, a focus on economic development. And so. Really, this is about the, the areas of land where, whether it's the insurance wasn't enough or isn't enough, or uh, there was other economic conditions that made it impossible, can't rebuild without significant investments. And so the state would give the money to the city, and then the city would work with, with business owners and developers to, to develop the property. 
Okay, Mr. Um, Chair. Representative Juggins. Uh, you, uh, you anticipated my other question. I was going to ask how that fits in with private insurance, and you covered that. So my only other question then is, um, would the cities then be responsible for repaying these appropriation bonds, or would the citizens of Minnesota have to repay the appropriation bonds? Commissioner. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, um, the state would be paying the debt service. So the, the debt service on the bonds, which is about $10 million a year over the life of the bonds, which would be around 20 years. So that would be the state's obligation. Um, the rest would be paid by uh, paid back by those uh, the bondholder. I'm, I'm sorry. What do you mean the, the uh, Mr. Uh, or uh, Commissioner, what do you mean the rest would be paid by the cities? Well, it's a loan. Sorry, Mr. Chair, Representative. So it's a it's a loan to the city from the state. We'd pay the interest on that loan to make a, a doable loan, but then the city pays pays back the state in that in that with those bonds money, uh, bond money. Uh, Commission, I just wanted to say that we will have a full hearing on this. The bill is going to be brought before us, and uh, I look forward to robust conversation on the 150 million dollars proposal. Uh, that is already going through uh, the body. So we will have an extensive discussion on this in the coming days. Um, any follow-up, Representative Jones? Uh, yeah, I'm still not clear who's paying what back. We're, so the state's paying the interest and the cities would repay the principal, is that? Or, or I, just, I, I think we'll, we'll get a full detail uh, conversation. We'll have a bill in front of us that we can actually take a deep dive. Uh, but I think as 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 always, appropriation bond through the state, it's the responsibility for the state uh, to, uh, you know, uh, pay for that uh, appropriation bond, just the same way as we do other bonding in, uh, in housing and many other uh, services. Uh, Commissioner. Yeah, Mr. Representative, I, it's an important question. I think there's some details that we need to work out, but it, I will invite Deputy Commissioner Kevin McKinnon, whose team runs these programs, because I want to make sure you feel like you've gotten the right level of detail here. Kevin, do you want to answer the question more specifically on, on repayment? Mr. McKinnon? Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, members, uh, you're right. The uh, debt service that the state uh, would cover every year obviously pays back the, uh, the uh, costs of that. And uh, as uh, uh, Chair Noor mentioned, uh, we will obviously be dis discussing it. Uh, in addition with MMB, uh, who is uh, really uh, helps us understand the appropriation bond uses and, and, uh, and the program along with the language. Okay, thank you. I, that, that's good enough for now then. I appreciate the, the answers. Uh, thank you, Representative Jogans. Uh, the next person uh, is going to be Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's uh, great to see you, Commissioner. Thank you for this great update. I think this is really covering a lot of good stuff. Um, and I think we will work through this as we do as legislators to work together to find the best pathway to really recover our whole state. And you know, I'm one that uh, knows Minneapolis, for example, is has got to have some help from us. We, if we don't rebuild or get Minneapolis at least stood up again, those businesses down there will not have a chance. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, people to point fingers at, but right now we want to get businesses back open, I think. And that's maybe my question today, Commissioner, is, um, you know, uh, we've, we've recently, um, and, and again, very good presentation on, on what's to come, some opportunities here to grow new growth, entrepreneurships, and so on. What are we doing to get our businesses open right now? We're still got uh, 50 to 75% of the hospitality workers not employed that could be employed. I know we just can't snap our fingers necessarily and get it open tomorrow, but we can do waves of this and phases of this. Can you tell us what is the governor doing right now with, with really uh, uh, seven day averages on, on positivity rates below the 5% caution mark? Immunizations are coming out better every week. Uh, businesses get this better than they ever have before. We did not see a spike after holiday, Christmas and New Year's Eve uh, that we were doing. How quickly are we going to see a phased in approach here to get our businesses completely back open so we can get Minnesota uh, businesses going again? What's What's the plan right now for that? Commissioner. 
<clears throat> Mr. Chair, Representative Baker, thanks for the question. And you've been an extremely thoughtful legislator and business owner on this front since the beginning of the pandemic. I've, I've learned a lot from our discussions. I, I would say you're right. We are optimistic right now. The numbers look really good. They do. They're below 5% case positivity. Cases per 100,000, I think, is now close to below 20. Hospital capacity is in, is in a safe place, the administrators, administrators tell us. So it is it is all positive news. Um, what the health department will tell you, and with good reason, is that these new variants are one, uh, you know, concern area of concern, and the ability of the vaccine to uh, to fight against them is something that um, continues to be tested. Um, so there are some unknowns. There are certainly health experts who uh, predict another surge in, in March, um, but that doesn't mean we we sit where we are for uh, you know for the duration of this pandemic. I think the governor very much understands there are still some restrictions in place that are. Uh, are challenging for businesses. Part of this is always tied up in consumer confidence too, right? And, and if people feel confident about going into a business, going into a restaurant or bar or what have you, and that they'll be safe. So it's all kind of part of the same mix. Regulations matter, of course, but it's that level of consumer confidence that's critical. Um, I can just tell you it's a very active discussion right now. Most of the state's economy is wide open, but it is at hospitality sector where there's the challenges, um, particularly large events. And this is the thing that we always knew would be kind of last in the cycle was when can we all be at Target Field again? You know, when can we have the, the community gathering downtown and not have to worry about, you know, capacity restrictions or size limits, or at least have limits be at a point where we can actually do the gather and not have to cancel it all together. We know a lot of business owners across the state are starting to schedule summer festivals, other events. Um, we're in very close contact with several of those individuals and talking about what could be possible and also understanding kind of from a commercially viable standpoint or from a kind of um, success and event standpoint, what would that number need to be to make sure that a reopening could work? So you're right. I think it will be in phases. It's not like we'll just kind of rip it all off at, at once, but I can tell you it's a very active discussion right now internally. And uh, the goal is always to move forward as, as quickly as we can and not see a, a surge or a spike at the, as a result of it. So I appreciate you asking the question and looking forward to continue to get your advice on it. Representative Baker. Just to chair, yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you. Just a quick follow-up then. As, as we're all now back in St. Paul or looped in, at least where we're at uh, virtually, um, I feel like it's our responsibility as legislators uh, to come up with plans and maybe present those to you. Are, is the governor and your, your staff and your department with MDH um, looking for ideas from us? Are you looking for proposals and bills? And if we see something like that, are you encouraging our, our uh, legislative leaders and, and the chairs to, to move forward to this? Because this is really important and it's something that uh, uh, we have uh, really great ideas. We're here now, we wanna work with the governor, we wanna be there. We hope that there's a better way that we can try to find uh, uh, collaboration right now before things get worse. But there's always gonna be some scares. There's always gonna be the what ifs, we don't know everything, but we sure know a lot more today than we did back in last March. And I think it's really that time we need to start focusing in on, on, on that level. But I do hear you saying, uh, you're very close to moving, but we've got to get this moving in waves. I hear you saying you're open to collaborating and, and working with us with some bill ideas and concepts. And maybe you can just, if that's what I heard you say correctly, that's what I, what I want to get. Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Representative Baker, yes, we would love to hear your ideas. We've, we've had a, a pretty open dialogue, I think, throughout um, and appreciate any, any phone call or email or idea that you want, want to put forward. Um, again, I think you're... Not just for you, because you happen to be a business owner and a member of this committee, but for all legislators, you have a perspective from your districts that really helps us. I'll just tell you, because I, th I think you know this, Representative Baker, but I'll make sure the whole committee knows. Um, we meet with hundreds, uh, if not thousands of businesses every month. We do a series of roundtables with hospitality, large events with the Chambers of Commerce across the, the, the state. Uh, already today, I've had two or three different meetings with individual businesses on, on their plans for reopening and, and where they're focused. So this is uh, always been a very close partnership with industry to figure out how to get it right, even if government and business won't always agree on exactly what those restrictions should be. So we do welcome that input. Um, we need that input. We, we, we'd like to continue that conversation. And, you know, again, I can't make any comments on timing. I can just tell you that the numbers are looking good for which we're very grateful and that we would like to move as always, you know, as quickly as we possibly can so that the discussions are, are ongoing. Thank you. I represent Haley. Thank you, Chair Noor, and thank you, Commissioner Grove, for your presentation. Uh, I've enjoyed working with you, and there's, as you said, lots of opportunity uh, here to get our economy back and get our businesses back open, as Representative Baker said. Um, but I have a few questions about 
the business loan program. And, and you might not have this data today, but I just wanted to throw it out there that um, before we, you know, we launch a, a new program, we'd like to see the data on the program that we did, you know, almost a year ago, as you said, how many businesses received those loans and what were the average amounts and kind of what was that uh, distribution like? And then also um, the one that we just, you know, passed in uh, December and the money from Department of Revenue, you know, went out in January and, and indeed you've had some grants as well. Can we get reports on those two programs? I know I've heard from some counties that um, up to maybe 30% of the applicants in the DOR bucket didn't qualify. Um, so I'd just like to see some of that data um, if possible. And then um, my other comment is on the uh, realigning the workforce development fund. And, and I applaud the work you've done there. I think it's, it's good work and something that we need to do. And I made this comment in our little subcommittee, but I wanted to um, go on record for this community, this committee as well, that I appreciate the, um, the innovation part of that structure that you're, you're trying to do. And particularly, I guess my bias is that we direct money in a targeted fashion to our industries that we know need um, new trained workers, um, advanced manufacturing, you know, agriculture, IT, healthcare. So I'd like you to consider that in that redesign. And on your equity focus, in um, I'll just speak for my communities. Um, we don't have a high percentage of, of BIPOC individuals. We have um, Hispanic folks in, in my district mainly. Um, so to me, it's not, um, an open job is an open job and a worker seeking work is a worker seeking work. And it's about connecting those dots. So my manufacturers that have open positions would just say, we don't care who it is, bring us the workers, right? So I guess I just wanted to make that statement and maybe, maybe there's innovative ideas in there to your point and new ways of of connecting uh, people of color to areas of the state where we have open jobs. And I'd like to see that there. So um, those are my comments. And uh, again, appreciate working with you and being able to um, move this, this forward so that more Minnesotans are working and working at uh, you know, wage levels to support their families and all of our businesses uh, succeed. Thank you, uh, Professor Paley. I'm assuming those are comments and recommendation to the commissioner. And uh, the next person is uh, Mr. Chair. Would, would you mind just because I think the first part of Rosalie's was a question on the the transparency of who won the awards. I did just want to address that briefly, if I could. Go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. First of all, thank you, Representative Haley. I think great points, both of them, and we really uh, think both both really important issues we need to tackle together. We have, we have posted the winners of the Small Business Emergency Loan Program, which is the first program that we ran already in the website, and we can circulate that. But you might have also been referring to our Small Business Relief Grants, which came out of that CARES Act funding. We are very close to releasing the results of that. We had to work with our community lenders to wrap up the final few loans, uh, sorry, grants there too. So that information will be public. And then you know, the deed component of the $215 million program is convention centers and movie theaters that just closed Friday. So we've got a, we got some work ahead of us to get that money out as quickly as possible um, that we'll, we'll work to do too. So I think you're right. That data should inform all of our, our future efforts and i um, happy to dig into it with you and your staff more deeply. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for, for the input. I know uh, we indicated in the previous round uh, the data due by June, uh, because the requirement is by March 15th, uh, the counties have to spend, otherwise the, the money will be returned back to the uh, general revenue. So we're waiting for those dates to close and we can get a clear data, but that does not mean that we will be sitting and waiting. We will have to come up with, uh, you know, suggestions and uh, input. I know uh, we all worked uh, together, Representative Baker, and Representative Haley and many of us work together to develop that uh, program. So we will have those inputs and I think we may get a chance for this committee to have a deep input into some of the programs that are being uh, managed by DEED and some of the recommendation for uh, the business assistant program. Uh, the next person is going to be Representative Cortizo Otun. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Grove. Thanks for coming back again. Um, I just I wanted to highlight a couple a couple things quickly. Um, so uh, Representative Haley and I um, worked together on the angel investor tax credit last last time around, and so I'm really pleased to see that um, still a part of the governor's budget for this year. And thank you so much for highlighting not only the the focus on equity uh, between uh, BIPOC women owned and veteran owned businesses, but also kind of the split between rural and urban um, and suburban. Um, Minnesota as we grow the, the uh, workforce in, in pockets across the state. I think there's a lot of potential um, all across Minnesota and I'm really excited to see what comes next. And with that money that's coming in from out of state, that investment's really important too. Um, I also did wanna just touch on the um, paid family um, leave uh, component as well, because it's, it's my understanding that um, that in states that already had an existing program, uh, workers were able throughout the pandemic to access these benefits and, and the funds more quickly. And then the businesses or employers didn't have to uh, cover upfront costs out of pocket and um, and then sit around and wait for reimbursement um, for, for those that kind of had to, had to wait for that with the family's first um, coronavirus response. And so I don't know if you have anything else to share specifically in, in terms of that, like um, states that you guys may be um, kind of taking a peek at their programs and, and looking into that. But I think that that's something that's really important to consider to make sure that we are able to um, continue supporting our workers, of course, um, but then that, that those businesses and employers are not having to having to delay and, and, and wait for um, extended periods of time to, to receive the funding from the federal government. Commissioner Gore. Mr. Chair, Representative, it's a great question. And you're right, one of the benefits of having other states have tried this is we have been able to um, monitor other states programs. Washington State in particular has been one of the states we've been following most closely. I, we had members of our team actually fly out to Washington uh, before this pandemic began and meet uh, at, at length with the program administrators there. And they've weathered this pandemic really well for the, exactly the reasons that you, you outlined. When you have a program like this in place, it just kicks into gear and you can deliver the benefits where they're needed at no extra cost to the business because they've they've built into the system this this protection so it's it's working exactly as designed and uh, we think it only increases uh job growth and economic growth because of what it provides for workers and certainly makes for happier employees too um and again we'll get into the details of this in, in a future session i hope but you know uh the, the idea here is to have some flexibility in the program right such that a business can use their own program if they already have one, they can buy into this if they if they need to. Everyone pays a little so that small businesses can, in particular, can take advantage of it who couldn't otherwise do it at scale. And that helps greater Minnesota uh, where, where small businesses are maybe more common than some of the larger corporates. So a um, lot of robust discussion to have on that program, but thank you for, uh, for bringing it up. Certainly, Mr. Chair, quick follow-up. Proceed, uh, Representative Quintiz Oton. Thank you. Um, and particularly, uh, it's, it's um, when we look at the the loss of jobs um, from women across uh, the country over the last year during the pandemic, I think that 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 um, having a, a program like paid family leave would would be such a huge um, benefit going forward to make sure that you know if if we have to take time away from the workforce, whether it's a mom or dad or another caregiver, um, being able to to take that time and then return to our jobs to make sure that um, you know there's there's just that. Continue, and there's not a lack of knowledge. The businesses aren't having to go out and recruit additional workers in the long term. And um, I, I just, I couldn't be happier that it's a part of the, um, the governor's budget package. I'm looking forward to working with you. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Represent Representative Cortez Artun. The next person in line is Representative Cagle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Grobe. I'm going all the way back to slide four, the Invest in Emergency COVID Support Fund. Um, you had mentioned that that was going to be split 50-50 between the metro area and greater Minnesota. Is that correct? Commissioner Gore? Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, uh, yes, that is, that's the, the place that we've started to make sure the money can travel the whole state. Um, I guess, Mr. Chair, uh, my question then, has there ever been any thought to like doing some of this stuff per capita? Because it seems like you know, when we split these dollar amounts, um, you know, 50-50, uh, we're asking the Metro to do more with less. Um, so I was just kind of curious if there had ever been any thoughts to, you know, if, if we can split it based on population or per capita. Commissioner Grove. 
Mr. Chair, Representative, it's, it's a great question. And I think it's a, a discussion that we should certainly have. I can tell you when members of Knorr and, and Baker and many others, Haley and others on this committee worked uh, at the end of last year on the $215 million package with the same debate came up and it's an important one. And you can do per capita, you can create floors such that everybody gets a certain amount. And then there's, you know, sort of a, a standard amount on top of that. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this. I think we started from a place of knowing that, that greater Minnesota uh, and the Metro have all suffered. And so 50, 50 seemed like a good starting point. Um, but I think this is the kind of discussion this committee should have. And I think you've raised a, a good point. Representative Cagle. Yeah, I think, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Commissioner. I think we really need to start having that conversation because um, it's something that, you know, we see um, so much of, of the revenue raised here in the metro area, but then so much of it goes out to greater Minnesota and um, it just doesn't seem very equitable or fair. I did want to um, also ask about the launch program. Um, in my prior life, I worked um, for community action agencies and one of the big programs that we had was a FAME program. Um, which really helped people invest in their education or if they did have, um, it was a savings, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar, but a savings program for people. Does that, do any of those programs interface together? Because I was just thinking if somebody's got a FAME account and wants to do this launch program, you know, it, it would really kind of meld the two worlds together where they might have some of their own startup money, but then help with, um, help some of the, you know, help from the state as well. Commissioner Group. Yeah, Mr. Representative, it's a great point. Um, there are other programs out there um, that help in a variety of ways new business owners get started. Um, and, you know, we think the more the better. The state has not had, we think, as robust of a presence in this area as uh, several other states have. And that was really the impetus of starting Launch Minnesota. It, it's proven that when you see these pockets of, of innovation happening across our country, governments are always involved in some proactive way. Governments are not going to be the ones that create innovation. It's the businesses who take advantage of the funding. But playing a role in the ecosystem from the perspective of state government makes a huge difference. The, the huge the growth in Silicon Valley startup ecosystem didn't happen by accident. There was a university there. The state did a major venture capital investment really early on. Uh, you had, of course, the defense uh, industry that played a big role out in California. Same thing was true in uh, out in Massachusetts, when, when that whole corridor opened up, it was uh, one of the first ever state-backed venture funds that made that possible. You take a look at a city like Austin, where it's become kind of like the default second headquarters for your big tech companies in, uh, in Silicon Valley. That didn't happen just by chance. I mean, the state and the university invested heavily there. So we've got to play a proactive role in this as a state. And, and you know, $5 million isn't a lot, but it is a start. And you combine that with Angel and Broadband and several other things, and it just starts to create this buzz that like Minnesota is a place where this stuff can happen. And we think we're well positioned to have a startup ecosystem that really is well suited to this pandemic. And part of the reason for that is that people that start companies in our state start them in sectors like healthcare and agriculture and in retail and in these a variety of diverse industries that are really uniquely positioned to figure out what's next in, in our economy, given the effect of COVID-19. So this is a moment we've got to take advantage of. Um, we've got to invest in. We've got to make noise about. We've got to little, lose a little bit of that Minnesota humility where we don't talk about the good stuff we do, because um, there's a lot of great stuff happening. We have amazing entrepreneurs in our state. So uh, the programs like you mentioned, Launch Minnesota is kind of this umbrella program for the ecosystem. It's a big part of the story of this next, next chapter of our economy. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, just a quick comment. Representative Cagle. Thank you. Um, you know, I just, I would hope that Deed would kind of do an inventory of, of some of the programs that are already out there and um, really work in conjunction with those programs, especially the community-based programs, because they're the ones that, you know, are the, are, you know, their community. And um, so I just, I hope that that is something that happens as well. So thank you. And I just wanted to mention there's, there are also federal programs uh, which can help, such as the Small Business Innovation Research uh, Program and also Small Business Technology Transfer, which is STTR. So, and then the Angel Tax Credit, all those programs with Launch Minnesota, I think there's a connection to help also with the technical assistance and with Launch Minnesota. I'm hopeful that uh, the launch has gone very well and looking forward to see how we can really connect some of the outside programs, including venture capitalists who are doing a great work in our state. I don't know if you've seen the data, there's an increase, there's, a, there's hope in that uh, ecosystem. So thank you, Commissioner, for that. Um, 
the next person is, uh, I see Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Grove for uh, the great presentation today. Um, I have a few questions. I guess I'll start with the, the Family Leave Act. It's a great program for small businesses to be able to you know, provide this for their employees. Do you have an idea on what the 0.6% would break down to per dollar of wage? Commissioner Approximately. Let me just pull up my notes on PFML. Um, so we think it would come to, uh, if, if employers and employ, oh, sorry, Mr. Chair, I didn't recognize you when I began speaking. Um, thanks for uh, oh, tolerating my miss. Uh, it, it comes out to a both contributing about 30 cents per $100 of employee earnings. Um, so if again, for a median worker, that's about two to three bucks a, a week. Um, so 30 cents on the $100 from each the employer and the employee. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, another question? Proceed, uh, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the loan programs. Now, back in uh, March, I believe it was, or February, whenever the governor's first loan program came out, the original uh, for forgivable loans with the 50% um, forgivable, 0%. Uh, one of the eligibility requirements for small businesses, and I heard from several small businesses in my community that they were not eligible because one of the requirements was that they must first go to a financial institution and um, be denied a loan. Um, and that's how it read in the on the deed website. So then they felt that because they could go to a bank, they had saved their money, um, ran their businesses well, that then they were ineligible for that loan program. Um, is that the case? And if so, could we just make this eligible to every small business? And I like the fact that, you know, we're gonna prioritize the smaller businesses because, you know, in my industry, they're the hardest hit right now. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit and, and let me know whether that would, because I read it and that's how I read it in the, on Deed's website, the initial loan program, I believe it was the $30 million um, that was offered out and just go ahead and, and explain that to me, please. Thank Commissioner Grove. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative, it's a great point. And um, this is not meant to be just a carbon copy of the original program. This is meant to be a new program. We, you know, it, it looks similar, so you're right to point out the similarities because of the, some of the carve outs and the targets in, the, in a sense. But the reason that original program had that stipulation in there was it, it landed at the same time as like a bunch of other funding sources landed. It was just when PPP landed. It was just when um, other federal assistance had landed. And so what we were trying to do at that time is say, we know state dollars are limited. Let's stretch them as far as we can by not doubling down on a state and federal dollar in the, same, in the same funding stream. I don't know that we would need the same stipulation in this program this time personally. And I think um, you're right to raise it as something that probably shouldn't be involved in the next iteration of this program. So um, we'll, we'll discuss it, but um, this is not meant to just be a complete carbon copy of that original program. It's it's meant to be a fresh look at it and we're at a different stage of the pandemic, obviously. So I'm, I'm glad you raised it. Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Grove for the understanding of that. I just have one more quick question about the job training incentive program. Um, the on the, so we're giving them money to boost automation for small manufacturers. Do we require them to um, maintain a certain amount of jobs or grow jobs so that we're not just giving them money to automate, to reduce jobs? Commissioner Grove. This is your Representative Frankie. Um, it's a great question. And I'm gonna turn over to my de our Deputy Commissioner, Kevin McKinnon, who um, who built this program and has run it just to talk through some of the kind of guidelines around how exactly it works. Deputy Commissioner McKinnon. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, members. Uh, <clears throat> the automation training component of this program uh, would deal with the um, uh, existing employees in a business. The job training incentive program deals with new hires. Uh, 
Uh, and so the automation component of this would be the retraining, the reskilling of existing uh, employees. Yes, there is a requirement for um, retention of those employees, uh, which uh, ranges from the term of the grant, uh, essentially, which are generally two years. Commissioner Grove, any additional? No, I think Kevin said it perfectly. Thanks. Uh, Representative Frankie? No. Thank you, Commissioner Grove. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Representative Hamill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, uh, we will have the conversation about uh, the dollars being invested, metro area or rural areas. Um, this is one of the reasons why I ran for office. Um, we had the huge disparities when it came to nursing home funding. You had metro rates, you had rural rates and deep rural rates. I represented deep rural. When it came to education funding, when I was on school board, our schools on a per pupil basis were receiving back then around $6,000 per pupil, where the cities were receiving close to $10,000 per pupil. When it came to transportation funding, we had a four lane highway that was scheduled to be completed in 1973. The money dried up and came to the metro area. And I got tired of seeing people dying on that dangerous highway. We will have this conversation. You know, I'd say that commodities, as far as our biggest export, a lot of people would say that it's ag products that come in and feed every single one of you every day. I would say that it's our children. Our children graduate the schools and they end up here in the metro area. We need to reverse that trend and invest in businesses and invest in people out in the rural areas so that we can grow our communities. So I look forward to that debate, Commissioner. Um, and uh, with that, I guess I'll end my remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Representative Hamilton. I, I hear you. Uh, we need to invest in our people so that we can all thrive. So I agree with you. We need to have conversation in some of the allocations and how we can create a robust economy for our state and to be able to support workers so that they can have a family living wage with benefits. And all those things are something that whether I want it for myself, for my children, for our communities, we have to understand uh, we're all in this together. So Commissioner Grove, any statement on that? Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, it's a great point. And it's, it's why we started with a 50-50 split for Greater Minnesota and the Metro area for that program. I'll just say more broadly speaking that, you know, you have a governor who is from Greater Minnesota, who cares about Greater Minnesota, and this is a budget that is good for Greater Minnesota. We didn't talk broadband much here because it's not in this committee's jurisdiction, but $50 million for broadband helps entirely, uh, you know, cities and towns outside of the metro area. And in the example of this loan program is just but one of many where there are uh, percentage uh, areas of focus on money going out, out of the metro area and into greater Minnesota. The annual tax credit's another, launch Minnesota is another. Um, we have to make sure this whole state thrives. And the idea that jobs or innovation only comes from the metro is just proven to be false. So let's call that what it is and, and build an economic development budget that um, helps the whole state grow. So I, I, I'm glad you raised this and looking forward to the more discussion. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, is there any other member with any question? We have uh, one minute uh, before we conclude. Um, I don't see any member raising their hand. I just wanted to thank you, Commissioner Grove and your staff for the presentation today. We Members, we have a lot of uh, work to do and we need to start working on these issues. Uh, we will have a robust conversation and we will be able to come out stronger uh, together. So looking forward for the conversation. Having said that, no any other business in front of us. So the meeting for today is adjourned. Thank you so much.